What you say, though, about the limitations that this imposes on us prompts in me the, the following thought. We're, we're all very used, I think, to the idea that in social life, each one of us as individuals tends to construct a picture of the world around his own experience. Mm. And indeed, we, it's difficult to see how we could do anything else. We're bound to do that. We've got no alternative. But it does mean that each one of us forms a systematically distorted view of the world because it's, in, it, because it's all uh, built up on what accidentally happens to be the mm -hmm. particular and really rather narrow experience of the individual who does it. Now, do you think that something of that kind applies to man as a whole because of the reasons implicit in your theory? That is to say that the, the whole picture that mankind has formed of the cosmos, of the universe, of the world, must be systematically distorted and what's more drastically limited by the nature of the particular apparatus for understanding that he happens to have. Well, I think that is undoubtedly the case, but again I would question the use of the word limited, which carries unfortunate suggestions. Uh, that is, I assume that one of our faculties, one of our mental organs, if you like, is, let's call it a science-forming capacity, a capacity to create intelligible explanatory theories in some domain. And if we look at the history of science, we discover that time after time, when particular questions were posed at a particular level of understanding, it was possible to make uh, very innovative uh, leaps of the imagination to rich explanatory theories that uh, presented an intelligible picture of that subdomain of the universe, often wrong theories as we later discovered, but there's a course that's followed. Uh, and this gives, uh, uh, this could have been the case only because we do have and we in fact share uh, across the species a si kind of a science forming capacity that is uh, that limits us, as you say, but at the same, in the same, by the same token, provides the possibility of creating explanatory theories that extend so vastly far beyond any evidence that's available. I mean, it's, it's very important to realize that, it should be obvious to say, but it's worth saying that when, when, a, when a new theory is created, and I don't necessarily mean Newton, I mean even a small theory, uh, what the scientist is typically doing uh, first of all, he has very limited evidence. The theory goes far, far beyond the evidence. Secondly, much of the evidence that's available is typically disregarded. That is, it's put to the side in the hope that somebody else will take care of it someday and we can forget about it. So at every stage in the history of science, there's uh, even normal science, not, you know, Kuhnian revolutions. There's a, a high degree of idealization that goes on. So there's selection of evidence, distortion of evidence, creation of new theory, uh, confirmation or refutation or modification of that theory, further idealization. These are all very curious steps. And we're capable of, uh, nevertheless, we can often make them and make them in a way which is intelligible to others. It doesn't look like some random act of the imagination. Uh, and where that's possible, we can, we can develop intelligible theories. We can gain some comprehension of the nature of this aspect of the world. Now, this is possible only because we are rigidly pre-programmed again because we have somehow uh, developed through evolution or however, uh, the specific faculty of forming very particular theories. Of course, it follows at once, or at least follow, it's, it's reasonable to assume that this very faculty, which enables us to construct extremely rich and successful theories in some domain, may lead us very far astray in some other domain. For example, there may be some, you know, again, a, a Martian scientist looking at us and observing our successes and errors from a higher intelligence, let's say, might be bemused to discover that whereas in some domains we seem to be able to make scientific progress, in other domains we always seem to be running up against a blank wall because our minds are so constructed that we just can't make the intellectual leap that's required. We can't formulate the concepts. We don't have the categories that are required to gain insight into that domain. Do you think that if uh, our study of uh, our language forming capacity and hence our cognitive capacities, as you call them, our abilities to know and understand and learn, if these studies re uh, that, that you're pioneering result in an enormously amount of increased knowledge of all these human faculties, do you think it's at all likely that that increased knowledge will, will enable us to change and indeed expand the faculties? 
That, I think, is extremely unlikely because I think the faculties are a biological given. Uh, we may study the structure of the heart, but we don't do so because we think it's possible to replace the heart by another kind of pump, let's say, which might be more efficient. Uh, similarly, here, I think if, if we ever did gain a real comprehension of the mental organs, uh, we would not, we might, that might help us in cases of pathology, uh, marginal cases, in other words. But I wouldn't see how that could give any way, at least with our present science of, or you know, plausible science, of modifying these capacities. What we might do, however, is gains, I mean, at least it's in theory imaginable, that we might discover something about the limits of our science-forming abilities. We might discover, for example, that some kinds of questions simply fall beyond the area where we are capable of constructing explanatory theories. And I think we even maybe now have some glimmerings of insight into where this delineation might be between intelligible theories that fall within our comprehension and uh, areas where no such theory is possible. Well, the case that we discussed before may be one. Take, take the question of, well, if you go back to the, you know, take go back to the early histories of science, history of science, early origins of science speculation, and people were raising questions about, say, the heavenly bodies uh, and about the sources of human action. Well, we're asking exactly the same questions now about the sources of human action. There's been no progress. We have no idea how to approach this question within the framework of science. We can write novels about it, but we can't construct even false scientific theories about it. We simply have nothing to say when we ask uh, the, the question, how does a person make a decision in a certain manner and not in some other manner when it's a free decision? That we just have no way of dealing with that issue. On the other hand, uh, the history of physics, let's say, has had substantial advances, and uh, very, it's very likely, I think, that that massive difference in progress in one domain and an absolute blank wall in another reflects the specific properties of our science-forming capacities. We might even be able to show that someday if it's true.